Hi all, and welcome to the Medical AI Lab tutorial session. Each Tuesday, a lab member covers a topic or tool in AI. These sessions are targeted to be broadly interesting to those interested in the cutting edge of AI and its applications in medicine. This week, we will have Catherine Tien talk about generative models, um, which have been gaining popularity in machine learning research. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Catherine to share the session. Thank you, Professor. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Catherine, a junior at Harvard. Um, I joined Professor Roger Picard's lab this semester, and I'm working on a project for generating text reports from chest x-ray images. So in general, I'm pretty excited about the problem of generation. And today, I wanted to talk a bit about some generative models, especially um, a new one that's taken the field by storm called diffusion models. Um, I borrowed a lot of great explanations from good references that I linked at the end of this presentation. Okay, let's get started. So I'm gonna go over um, these things today. And um, first, let's talk about the types of diff uh, generative models. So they can be split into likelihood-based models and implicit generative models. You've likely seen BAEs and GANs before, um, but there's a new type of model called diffusion models under the likelihood-based category that has been um, making a lot of improvements and beating GANs lately. Um, so for some background on these two types of generative models, likelihood-based models generally try to model the data distribution, um, P of X, using a like parameterized version P sub theta of X. And to train likelihood-based models, you ideally want to maximize the data log likelihood to find your optimal parameters. Um, there's some limitations of this method though. So um, a challenge is that P of X has this constraint. It needs to integrate to one because it's a probability uh, density function. And so you often need this normalizing constant Z, which is tricky to work with. Um, VAEs and normalizing flow models have two different solutions to this. So VAEs, um, they keep Z intractable, um, but they deal with this by optimizing an approximate likelihood. So um, using a variational lower bound on the likelihood in order to solve the Z problem. And normalizing flows on the other hand, Zs are, uh, the Z is like tractable, but it restricts model architectures in order to keep it tractable. So note here, there's a trade-off between tractability and flexibility. Normalizing flows are um, a tractable problem, but restricted. And VAEs um, deal with intractable settings, but um, have to use like this approximate inference. Um, on the other hand, implicit generative models don't model the data likelihood directly. Instead, um, something like GANs are trained adversarially, um, where there's like a generator model and a discriminator model um, trained with a minimax loss. Um, even though GANs have generally like achieved state of the art since they've been introduced, um, there's still some limitations. So adversarial training can be unstable and have difficulties in converging. Um, also, they face like challenges with sample diversity. Sometimes um, they face mode collapse. So if like a distribution has many peaks, um, some of them might just like disappear from the models that are generated. And um, likelihood-based models usually don't have troubles with uh, mode collapse because if this peak disappears, then the likelihood, uh, the data likelihood would be very, um, would not be good, but because we maximize like the data likelihood, we capture the peaks. Okay, um, yeah, so moving on to the new type of model, diffusion models, um, which are able to outperform GANs um, now. The history of diffusion models is a little bit complex, so I wanted to go over it. Um, they were first introduced in 2015, inspired by non-equilibrium thermodynamics, um, but they weren't very widely used. And then in 2019, something called score-based models came out of um, Stefano Urban's group at Stanford and achieved state-of-the-art inception scores on Cypher 10, which is pretty amazing that a new model class um, can achieve comparable results to GANs, which have already had people working on them and tuning architectures and improving them for a couple of years. Um, then in 2020, um, Ho et al. from Berkeley showed an equivalence between score-based models and diffusion models. Um, 
So uh, using some, I guess, like choices inspired by score-based modeling, they improved diffusion models to also achieve state-of-the-art FID scores on Site 410. Um, the two, I guess, motivations behind score-based models and diffusion models are different, but I think it's important to note both. So I'll first go over score-based models and then the diffusion processes motivation. Okay, so score-based models, um, if you recall this problem with the normalizing constant from before, score-based models simply sidestep it by modeling the gradient of the probability distribution. So um, this value, the gradient, is called the score. And to visualize what's going on, um, take a look at this figure in the right. Um, this is the, like, I guess, a Gaussian mixture model where the two peaks or two clusters are here. The reddish, like blue lines are probability contours. And typically um, with traditional likelihood-based models, we would try to find the values of like these levels. But instead, um, a score-based model cares about these black arrows or the gradients um, of the probability distribution. So we can represent a distribution such as like, you know, a Gaussian mixture model um, using the arrows instead of the level curves. In order to do this in practice, we introduce a score network. Um, and it's parameterized by theta, so S sub theta of X. During training, um, okay, so to train this score network, we want to minimize the loss, which um, they define as the Fisher divergence between the estimated score and the true score, um, which is just like an Euclidean distance here. And note that we don't actually have access to the true scores um, because we just have like data points X1 through Xn. But uh, there's an existing family of methods called score matching methods that can compute the Fisher divergence we want without access to the true scores. Um, and in particular, they proposed a sliced score matching method using projections to one dimension that are computationally efficient during backpropagation. And so now we can train a score network um, without adversarial training, we just have a loss. So this is like a big plus that we're just using, uh, we're just optimizing this loss function. Um, okay, so now that we can train our score network, we also want to sample from it. Now the question is like, how do you sample from a score network, I guess? You only have access to the gradients of the probability, but not to the probabilities themselves. Um, the solution is to use something called Longevin Dynamics, which is an MCMC-based method. Um, essentially, you initialize the Markov chain with some X naught sampled from a prior distribution. And then you take like iterative steps um, until you hit XK, which is your final generated image. And what these steps are doing is say, okay, so say X zero was sampled from here. Then you want to take a step in the direction of the gradient um, with step size epsilon. And then you also add a little bit of noise. Um, and this gradient, we simply um, calculate using our score network. So S of theta of xi. And um, I guess I also wanted to mention, we have some nice ther theoretical guarantees on the sampling process. So in the limit and under some regularity conditions, as epsilon goes to zero and k goes to infinity, um, xk, the final generated image, actually converges to a sample from the true distribution, which is what we want in theory. And in practice, they found that with sufficiently small epsilon and sufficiently large k, um, the error is negligible. OK, so. This is kind of like roughly how score-based models work, but it turns out that naive score-based models didn't just um, work right away. There's some problems it faces. So uh, real world data often lies on lower dimensional manifolds. Um, and in this case, the score function becomes undefined. Also in low data density regions, score matching becomes inaccurate, which leads to low quality sampling. So to solve these problems, um, they found a solution was to perturb the data with Gaussian noise. So 
Um, perturbing data with Gaussian noise solves the manifold problem because it kind of disrupts the manifold. And um, it also allows for better exploration of low data density regions if data is like, perturbed into a lower density region. Now we face this trade-off, right? Because if you perturb the data with too much noise, um, it'll be like the data will look inaccurate. And if we don't perturb the data enough, we might not explore the low data density regions enough. So they address this trade-off with um, taking many different noise levels, sig uh, sigma one and up to sigma L. And then they define a noise conditional score network that takes an X and also like some arbitrary uh, noise level sigma. And the training objective is now the weighted sum of Fisher divergences across all noise scales. And they also have to modify the sampling process to use annealed Langevin dynamics with decreasing noise scale. Um, I guess just to clarify exactly what the change is, here, instead of a sub theta of xi, we also take in like the noise uh, term. And so given like xi and sigma i, we can obtain our xi plus one and continue with like annealed uh, Langevin dynamics. So uh, I just wanted to also mention that the network architecture they chose was a UNET and this resulted in state-of-the-art inception score on CIFAR 10. Okay, so that's it for score-based models for now. And I wanted to cover the other angle of diffusion processes. Uh, so the idea behind diffusion processes is that um, it's like this Markov chain that has a forward and reverse interpretation. Um, the main breakthrough with performance came out of this paper, um, but this paper from OpenAI also improved um, diffusion models. So um, the forward process actually goes in this direction. The way it works is you take a data point from the real, like a real data point, and you add a little bit of noise. So uh, you can pick the amount of noise as Gaussian and you get X1. And then you keep adding noise until you end up with this image here. Um, that's just completely unrecognizable noise. And that's how the forward process works. So imagine if you wanted to reverse this process, you would get to start with noise and then you would like apply some denoising network on it repeatedly until you end up with a realistic image. And that's how um, diffusion processes generate images. Um, so notice that the forward direction is easy to do. You can just add noise and you know how to do that. But the reverse process, it's like less clear. How do you um, denoise the images? And the way they do that is to train like this denoising network. Um, so to explain how that works or like the loss function for that, we can think of like the forward transitions as using this like probability distribution Q of xt given xt minus one. And this we know is like some Gaussian perturbation here. And then we want to find um, Q of xt minus one given xt, but it's unknown. So ideally we want this in order to reverse the Markov chain, but instead we model it using P sub theta. So this thing right here, a uh, piece of data of xt minus one given xt goes in the reverse direction. And um, in order to train piece of data, we want this loss function. So um, this paper mentions that we can think of this p and this q as making a variational autoencoder. So this thing um, makes a VAE and we can think of the diffusion model as just like a bunch of stacked VAEs, which is pretty interesting. So then you just like take your normal VAE elbow and you add them up and you get your elbow for the diffusion model. Um, I guess like one thing that I found was interesting is like you can think of this diffusion model as like a latent variable model where all of these like X1 through XT are latent variables. 
And you might wonder like, okay, why does this thing do better than a VAE? And um, so a VAE is just like one chunk and maybe adds like one like larger noise component into the latent, but um, a diffusion model is able to split it up over many smaller steps. And so kind of like the intuition we gave before with uh, Langevin dynamics with um, multiple noise levels, maybe the same thing is happening here. And that's why a diffusion model does better than VAEs. Um, okay, so then the last thing I wanted to mention is this equivalence to score-based models. So this paper proved that um, this elbow is equivalent to some of the score matching objectives. And also um, that they also re-parameterized the diffusion model in a way that was like inspired by Langevin dynamics and this enabled performance breakthroughs on diffusion models. So it's pretty cool that these two angles came together and um, helped make some improvements. Okay, um, that, I think that's all I'm gonna say about math. And now I'm just gonna show some pretty pictures. So here um, is, are some examples of Langevin dynamics or diffusion processes, starting with noise and ending up with um, pretty clear images. Um, diffusion models are also good for like inverse problem solving. So something like in painting where part of the image is missing and you have to fill it in. Um, diffusion models are particularly suitable for that. So here's like some examples from the score-based model paper. And then I wanted to show some results like comparing diffusion models to GANs. So this, um, these are GAN generated images. These are diffusion model generated images. And these are images from the training set. And so we can see like the sample diversity issue from GANs where these images kind of all look the same and not capturing like the diversity from here. But we see that um, di diffusion models like, don't have this issue. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then future directions. So I kind of went over some of the history of these papers, but at the end of last year, we can see that diffusion models are being used for new like image to image tasks, like uh, photo editing and generation from text prompts or uh, these image to image tasks. And I think um, there's like a lot of new work also to improve diffusion models such as like experimenting with noise schedules, improving sampling speed and dealing with like how to evaluate them. Um, so there's a lot to be done with like changing architectures and improving diffusion models. Okay, I think that's all for my presentation. There's some code here um, that you can see if you're interested in how to implement them. Here's some references that were really good. Further reading of like interesting things going on and some other notes. Okay, so thank you all for listening and I'm happy to take any questions since I know that was kind of a lot in 20 minutes. Great, great. Thanks. Thanks for the great presentation, Catherine.